We're in a series called Into the Fire, and we're using the word fire as that idea that every one of us has decisions to make regularly, and those decisions will lead us to places of comfort or to places of difficulty. And quite often, the decision God wants us to make is a decision that will lead us to a place of discomfort, a place of difficulty, a place of fire. And so we've studied a couple stories so far in the book of Daniel that kind of illustrate that for us, and I'll do a little recap in just a moment. But I want to start our time by letting you know a little bit more about me. I want to share with you my most embarrassing moment. Well, it's not my most embarrassing moment. My, my most embarrassing moment happened in the Holiday Inn on a Sunday morning when I said something I shouldn't have said from this stage right here, and I'm not going to tell you about it because that's a really embarrassing moment. Some of you were here that day, and I'm just like, let's move on. Anyway, my second most embarrassing moment was, again, something that came out of my mouth that should not have come out of my mouth, but it's okay for me to tell you that because it was a long time ago. So here's the deal. What happened was we were in Pennsylvania visiting my family. My dad's family is all from Kenadensis, the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania. A beautiful place. We're in my grandma's house, and she's got this, this lovely house that my grandfather himself built with his brother, nestled into the woods, and it's this beautiful, idyllic place. If you ever write a novel, that's the place where you want to write it. I mean, just forests all around. Anyway, my uncle Keith still lives up there, and uh, my grandmother still lives up there too, and and so we were all there visiting, and my Uncle Keith is one of my favorite people on the planet. He knows how to tell a story about anything. I mean anything. So we're sitting there in the living room, and he is regaling us with stories of the most normal events that, when they come out of his mouth, are hilarious. He's telling us about repairing lawnmowers, and he's telling us about this friend he had in high school who did this crazy thing or whatever, and we're all in stitches. The room is electric with laughter. And I remember every one of us in the room is sort of on pins and needles. We're appreciating Keith, but we also know that it's going to be our moment at some point to contribute to this conversation. We're all looking for that window when we can say that thing that is going to keep the laughter going. And so on the other side of the room, I'm sitting across from my Aunt Lorene and Uncle Bob, and they're, they're my, two of my favorite aunts and uncles, because when I was a kid, they always gave me science toys for Christmas, and I thought that was cool. And so they won favorite aunt and uncle for that. But Keith is also my favorite uncle because he tells great stories, and, and my other two uncles are my favorite too. But anyway, so uh, Lorene and Bob are sitting across from me, and, and Aunt Lorene speaks up, and she begins adding to, to this room full of laughter, and she's telling us a story about how she can never find clothing for Bob, her husband, because she... He, She's not allowed to shop at any place except for the sale racks. And by the time the clothes get to the sale racks, they don't have Uncle Bob's size. You know, they only have the weird sizes. They don't have the normal sizes. And so I'm trying to figure out when I'm going to contribute to this conversation. I see my window of opportunity right then. So I speak up and I say, yes, I know exactly what you mean. Every time I go to the store trying to shop for something, I don't like paying any money at all. So I go to the sale racks and I can't find anything there in my size. I only find these crazy weird sizes. And here I exaggerate greatly. And I say, I only find these crazy weird... Now I'm in high school. Please forgive me for what I'm about to say. I say, I only find these crazy weird sizes. They're like 48 by 30. And I do exactly that. 48 by 30. And Aunt Lorene says, that's Bob's size. <laughs> and honestly, I don't remember anything after that. <laughs> like, I could have turned it around and said some type of witty comment, like, we should change stores or something <laughs> like that. But, but I didn't. At that moment, I don't remember if the room laughed or if the room was silent. I don't remember crickets or laughter or what. I just remember me right inside of me, inside this place right here, doing this kind of thing. <laughs> now, I put on a, a pretty good face, and the room is kind of laughing and stuff, so I don't really remember what happened there. It's all a blur and a blank for me, but I remember this. I hate to feel humiliated. I think every one of us hates to feel humiliated. None of us really enjoys it. In fact, if you like being humiliated, um, well, let's just talk afterwards because you've got some issues, but I think none of us really wants to be humiliated at any point in time. We avoid it. We fear it. We, we try to run away from it, and it's because of this. It's because humiliation 
makes me feel less than I want to feel about me. It has nothing to do with reality. It just makes me feel less than I want to feel about me. I want to feel like I'm the kind of person who never says anything stupid. I want to feel like I'm the kind of person who, when I open my mouth, the family members in my room all laugh. I want to feel like I'm the kind of person who can be the life of the party. And when someone else begins to not think that about me, then I begin to change the way I feel about me, and then I feel embarrassed slash humiliated slash something that I don't like. And so I make choices to avoid humiliation whenever I can. You probably do too. But there's a moment today in our story where a man had the opportunity to choose between humbling himself and not. And the end result of him not choosing to humble himself was that he got humiliated. I think it's a fascinating story, and we're going to go to it in just a moment. It's in Daniel chapter 4. So if you take the Bibles we passed out, it's on page 616. And as you're flipping there, as you're getting ready to get there, I want to just give you a little bit of a recap of where we've been so far. In 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar came to power in the land of Babylon. And he decided he was going to conquer the nations around him so that he could be the number one king who's ever lived. He wanted to have an empire. And part of his process for conquering the other nations was that he would go to the city, the most important city of that other nation. He would lay siege to it, which means he would encamp around it and make sure they could get no food or water into the city until they eventually gave up. And when they gave up, he would take all of the richest, all of the handsomest, all of the prettiest, all of the best and the brightest, all of the cream of the crop, and he would deport them from their hometown to Babylon, where he would train them up to be his personal courtiers. They would be in the court of the king, and they would be the smartest, best, and brightest, so that the city of Babylon would have the smartest, best, brightest, strongest, handsomest, everything that you could have, and then those, own, those countries in their capital cities would only have the poor and the not very smart and the less important people, and so the countries would get weaker and Babylon would get stronger, and so he deported from Jerusalem. Four guys. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He deported them among some others, and these were the best and the brightest. He brought them to his citadel in Babylon, and he decided he was going to make them the greatest people they could possibly be. And so, King Nebuchadnezzar issued a decree that they should eat the royal food, and that conflicted with their understanding of God's law. So Daniel stood up against the king and said, go ahead and put me to the test. Put me on some type of fiery trial. I'm going to eat only this kind of food. You keep your own food and then test us to see what happens. And Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged that Daniel, following God's law, was better than all the other people who had eaten his food. Chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar issues a decree. And the decree is that all of the wise men, including the Jewish people, Daniel and his friends, should be killed because the king's dream was not interpreted. And Daniel says, wait a minute, it's against God's law for you to just go ahead and kill people randomly who are innocent. So I'm going to step forward against the king and say, give me some time. Put me to the test. I will go and talk to my God with my friends, and then we'll see what happens. And God shows up. He gives them the king's dream and the interpretation of it. And so Daniel comes back, and the king acknowledges that God is really in charge. Daniel chapter 3, the king issues a decree And the decree is that they should worship an idol that he has built. But that flies in the face of God's law. And so Daniel's three friends, who also go by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, stand up against the king, even though Daniel's nowhere around. They take it upon themselves to stand up against the king and say, we will not bow down to this idol, nor will we serve your gods. And the king says, okay. And they go to a literal fire when he throws them into a furnace. But they survive. And they come out not even smelling of fire. And the king acknowledges that their God is their God, is the real God, the God of heaven. Are you picking up on the pattern? The king thinks he's in charge, does something, says something. People of God stand up against him. God comes through for them. And the king recognizes that God's really in charge. Three times so far it's happened. When we get to Daniel chapter 4, what do you think is going to happen? 
Well, it's actually different. But the pattern is very similar. We find some very interesting things here that are similar, but it's also quite different. Take a look at it with me. Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. Now, now, wait a minute here. This is a little weird, okay? Because if you're familiar with the way the Bible is written, you know that sometimes in the Bible there are personal letters that show up. It happens mostly in the New Testament. You know, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, to the saints in Ephesus, grace and peace to you from God our Heavenly Father, is something like that. It always goes in the same pattern. Paul would say his own name to the people he's writing to, and then he would give them some type of encouragement. It happens that way all the time in Paul's letters. You know why? Because that's the way all ancient letters were written. You know, what we do is we type an email, and the sub, the, it has the two line in there, and then it has the subject line, and you have to put a subject line in there for some reason. And then you write something, and it, we usually follow the same pattern, ignoring whatever the person said before, and we just start typing. Or maybe you follow a different pattern, dear so-and-so, or whatever. We all kind of have our own patterns. But the entire ancient world followed the same pattern. Why is that important? It's because this is a personal letter. This pattern tells us this is a personal letter from Nebuchadnezzar to everybody on the planet. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is the Babylonian king who has conquered Jerusalem, who is a pagan. He is not part of God's family. He is not a Jew. He is not one of God's kings. He's in Babylon, not Jerusalem. He's not a descendant of David. He's outside the family of God entirely. What is he doing with his letter in our Bible? He doesn't deserve... I mean, after all, this is probably after King Nebuchadnezzar has captured King Zedekiah from Jerusalem. And when he captured Zedekiah from Jerusalem, you know what he did? He slaughtered his sons before Zedekiah's very eyes and then put out Zedekiah's eyes so that the last thing Zedekiah ever saw on this planet was his own children dying. That's what Nebuchadnezzar does to people. Nebuchadnezzar, the guy who for three chapters now has been threatening to cut people up into little pieces and turn their houses into rubble if he didn't get his way. This guy, this guy has his words in your Bible. Now, that's just weird. What this tells me, tells me something really significant. And let me read the next couple verses here just to show what I'm talking about. In verse 2, he says this, It's my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders, hear this, that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Something happened in Nebuchadnezzar's life where God broke in. God blessed him. God demonstrated his supremacy to him. God demonstrated how much he was in charge, even though Nebuchadnezzar thought he was in charge. And whatever God did to Nebuchadnezzar is a story so powerful that it causes Nebuchadnezzar to become a worshiper of the Most High God and for his words to make it into your Bible. I want you to write this down. Here's your first blank for the day. It goes like this. God can... And does work in the lives of unlikely people. God can and does work in the lives of unlikely people. Specifically, what I want you to take into your heart from that, don't ever write anyone off. Don't ever write anyone all the way off. Every Jewish person of the day would have written Nebuchadnezzar off. No one can ever touch that guy. He's too wicked, too evil. Nothing can ever happen to bring that guy around. And yet his letter gets into our Bible because God does something. God does something in this guy's life that he considers miraculous and wonderful. Don't ever write anyone all the way off. Okay, let's get into the meat of the story here. It really goes from Daniel chapter 4, verse 4 on. 
And this is a long section. I'm going to read all the way through 27. And you're going to hear a dream being described. And it's being described and interpreted. And it kind of goes twice. They say the same things over and over again. So what you might do if you begin to fall a little bit asleep, you might just want to say, okay, what have I already heard? And if you hear it a second time, that's important. That's called repetition. It's key. Keep it in your mind. Here we go. Chapter 4, verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here's my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me. But you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. So he's had this dream. And there's one thing I want you to just file away before we get to the interpretation. This dream has a tree, and that tree provides shelter and food for everything on the earth. That tree is great, it's glorious, it's huge, and it provides shelter and food for everything. Now let's hear the interpretation. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals and having nesting places in its branches for the birds? Your majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky, and your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. But there's a part of the tree that doesn't get applied to the king. What should come next? And you have provided shelter. What should come next? And you have provided food. But it's not there. Instead, that part is just skipped. Verse 23, Your majesty saw a holy one a messenger coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heavens. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This 
is the interpretation, your majesty. And this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone He wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then, it may be that then your prosperity will continue. The main points of the dream are pretty clear. It's a judgment against the king. God says, I made you to be this great tree. I made you to have a glory that extends to the heavens. And I put you in your place that you would provide shelter, that you would provide food for the whole world. And yes, you are great and you're glorious. And yes, your kingdom extends even to the sky. We'll just skip over the other part. And so I'm going to judge you. I'm going to cut you down. I'm going to cast you out. And this is crazy. The prediction is for a mental disease called boanthropy. There's an actual disease called lycanthropy, which is when you think you're an animal, and boanthropy when you think you're a cow. And somehow God says, you're going to get this disease you never heard of before. In fact, this might be the first time it ever shows up. We're just going to give it to you. You're going to become sick. You're going to have boanthropy. You're going to think you're a cow. And you're going to go out into the fields and you're going to chew on the grass. No one's going to pay attention to you as a leader because after all, you're a cow. And so we're not going to follow you as the king. No king can be a cow. No cow can be a king. Let's just st- keep, with, keep with that. So here you're going to be cast out. And then seven years later, you're going to come back. I'll give you your kingdom back after you recognize I'm in charge. That's what God says. After you recognize I'm in charge and I give kingdoms to the people I want to give kingdoms to. Now, he's got a choice to face. If you pay attention to Daniel's words, they're very interesting. Daniel says, pay attention to my advice, king. Change your ways now and maybe... God will let your prosperity continue. Maybe you won't have this hiatus. Maybe you won't have this break in your kingdom. Maybe God will let your prosperity continue if you just do the right thing now. Acknowledge Him as God over all. Acknowledge Him as the source of your kingdom. And then do the things He's asked you to do, to care for people, to not oppress people, to lift them up. Do the right things, King, and maybe He'll let your prosperity continue and Nebuchadnezzar has a choice, and obviously his choice is to pick the easy path or the difficult path, because for a king with that much glory, a king with that much prestige, a king with that much riding on it, the hard thing to do is to change, to humble yourself and to lift up the oppressed. You know why? Nebuchadnezzar wasn't elected. Nebuchadnezzar got to where he is in his mind, by his power. And if he shows a sign of weakness, if he suddenly becomes Mr. Nice King, the people around him that he stepped on to get to the top of this ladder just might get back at him. You see, Nebuchadnezzar has a decision to make. Do I choose the path that God is revealing to me of humbling myself and possibly facing the fire of difficulty with all these people coming at me? Or do I choose the path that I already know because I've already walked it that shows me it's a little bit more comfortable because I, can, I know I can maintain my power? What's going to happen? Let me share with you a couple verses. We're, we're going to step out of this story right now and we're going to give you something that Daniel knew that the king didn't. Something that Daniel knew from the whole history of the Old Testament. There are a few verses here I want to show you. Way back in Genesis chapter 4, God is talking to Cain. This is the guy who kills his brother Abel for the first murder ever, okay? God is talking to Cain before the murder happens, and he says this, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? 
But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. God says to Cain, you have two choices. You can choose to do what's right and I'll accept you. But if you choose to do what's wrong, sin will grab you and control you. Let's go on. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, Moses is giving to the people of Israel his last words, his last charge before he goes up to the top of the mountain and God buries him. Deuteronomy 28, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. And then he gives a chapter long list of blessings. But, verse 15, however, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. And he finishes up the rest of the chapter with a list of curses. One more. 1 Samuel 12, 15. But if you do not obey the Lord and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your ancestors. Here's the principle that shows up in the Bible time and time again. The principle is you've got a decision to make for God or a decision to make for me, for yourself. And the principle is that if you choose God's path, it leads you to a place of blessing. And if you choose your path, it leads you to a place of cursing. But we don't see things that way. We see things differently. This is the way we tend to see them. We see if I make this decision for God, it's going to lead me to a place that feels like fire. If I stand up to the king and don't bow down to his idols, I might be thrown into a furnace. If I stand up to the king and I don't eat this food that he provides for me, then I might not be as healthy and then I'll be cast out from this favored group of people. If I don't do this thing, I'm going to end up in a place of hardship. A decision for God, we feel, leads us to a place of hardship. A decision for me, we feel, leads me to a place of ease and comfort because I've already been there. I know that. But what the Bible says very clearly the whole Old Testament says this time and time again, is that that is a lie. Because our choice for God does not lead us to a place of fire. It leads us through a place of fire. A choice for God may temporarily take me into a place of hardship, difficulty, and fiery testing, but it will lead me to a place of blessing. And a choice for me may lead me through a place of ease and comfort for a time, but it will lead me to a place of cursing. That God has designed this world in such a way that if I follow him, great blessings will happen. But if I don't, there's some type of curse thing going on. That just simply means that God makes it so that the way things should work don't work that way. Blessing is when you experience what God says he created the world to be. Cursing is when you encounter the world in a way that it's not supposed to be. It doesn't work the way it should work. Have you ever been in a place where you said, man, I really thought that was going to work, and it didn't work? That's an example, potentially, of a feeling of curse. What if your entire life ends up that way, and the life God designed you to have doesn't work out the way he designed you to have it, and you end up in a place of perpetual curse. That's no good. That's the decision Nebuchadnezzar is facing. That's the decision all of us face all the time. And so the question for us is, which choice will you make? Which choice did he make? Let's look at it. Chapter 4, verse 28 now. It says in verse 28, all of this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Well, that's not good. All that we just read about, it ended up happening, and this is how it happened. Let's see. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Ah, oh, haven't I done all this wonderful stuff all for me? I'm good. Thumbs up to me. Well, even as the words were on his lips, 
A voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from the people and ate grass like an ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Now, that's not saying that he actually had feathers growing out of his skin. You know, some people would be like, oh, that's too much of a miracle. You know, whatever. It doesn't mean that. What it means is his hair grew that crazy, that nappy. We're talking something along the lines of dreadlocks on your arms, okay? Because you go seven years without a bath rolling around in the mud. Let's just see what happens to your hair. Maybe Nebuchadnezzar was a hairy man anyway. I don't know, but whatever. So here's the deal. Seven years, he thinks he's an ox. He's eating grass. He's out there. He made the wrong choice. And the crazy thing to me is that he thought he was choosing the easier path that would avoid fire. But he actually chose the path that led to more hardship and more difficulty. If he had picked God's path, there would have been a little bit of fire, but much blessing. But no, he picks his path, and he ends up with a little bit of comfort and a whole lot of problems. Seven years, he's like a cow. Kind of crazy. Let me give you a blank to fill in. You can't, well, actually, I guess I I need to give you something else first. Okay. I I was going to jump ahead, but I won't. Okay, so here's the deal. I got to tell you something. This story here has been debated. Um, It's been debated by historians and scientists for a long time. They question that it ever really happened to Nebuchadnezzar. And and they don't question the fact that he was sick with this boanthropy disease. They know that exists. They don't question that. What they question is that it actually happened to Nebuchadnezzar. And I'll tell you why. It's because... Some of you have heard the phrase about the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, you've heard people talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls have some documents in there that are very close to our Bible. They have some copies of the Bible, portions of it in the Old Testament. But the Dead Sea Scrolls also happen to have a lot of other stuff. And one of the other things they have is a story that is exactly the same as this story with just a few minor tweaks and one big tweak. And the one big tweak is that Nebuchadnezzar's name doesn't show up. Instead, it's Nabonidus' name. Nabonidus was the last king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was the greatest king. Nabonidus was the last king of Babylon. And so they read this document and they say, oh, the sickness happened to Nabonidus. The Bible got it wrong. Proof it couldn't have been written by Daniel. Proof it couldn't have been written as a personal letter from Nebuchadnezzar. It's all made up. It's all fake because it really happened to Nabonidus. That's what they say. On top of that, there's some Babylonian records that seem to indicate Nabonidus had a problem because at one point in time, he built a tower, a statue that kind of angered the gods around him and, and got him into some trouble or whatever. And, and so the story is kind of crazy, but it's, it's weird that it seems to have happened to Nabonidus and not Nebuchadnezzar. So I was wrestling with this, and I want you to understand something that's going on. Number one, People who don't want to believe the Bible will find any excuse to not believe it and to say it was made up. And even there's another group of people, it's it's the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. They believe that this passage here proves to us that the text of the Bible has been transmitted to us with errors. And it's been translated and other things have been added to it because Daniel should have said Nabonidus and the Mormon church believes he did say Nabonidus and that for decades and centuries that it got changed. And so now we can't really trust the text of the Bible we have. That's why we need the Book of Mormon according to their doctrine, their theories. But I want you to know what's going on here because people will say, here we have this outside document that seems to indicate this document is wrong. Therefore, this document must be wrong. But if we look a little deeper, we find some interesting things. Number one, there are three theories of how this could have possibly worked and this to be true. Three theories for how this could have all worked together. I'll give you some of these theories. Number one, the madness happened to both 
Nabonidus and Nebuchadnezzar. That this sickness thing actually happened to both kings. Daniel tells us about Nebuchadnezzar's problem, and uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls tell us about Nabonidus' problem. Similar stories, but it just happened to both of them. Option number two, the Dead Sea Scrolls are just wrong. They should have written Nebuchadnezzar in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but instead they said Nabonidus. So the Dead Sea Scrolls got it wrong. Option number three, and this one I found on the internet. I don't think anyone supports it, but this guy thought he had a vision from God telling him the answer for Daniel chapter four. And so I thought, since this guy thought he had a vision from God, maybe I should at least tell you. And as a matter of fact, it was the one that I thought was the coolest of all of the answers because it just seemed kind of fun. But maybe Nebuchadnezzar and Nabonidus are actually the same person. And I won't get into all that, but you know, maybe they just were actually the same person because there was only seven years that divided the end of Nebuchadnezzar's reign and the beginning of Nabonidus' reign. And so maybe you know, that could have happened. I don't know, maybe the seven-year inter- intervening time was him and he changed his name when he came back. It doesn't matter. Here's the deal. I couldn't make a decision. I didn't know what was going on. So this last week, I actually contacted my Old Testament professors from seminary days, from graduate school. And I was like, can you help me? And I thought they weren't going to respond to me, but they did. So I got a response, and I'll give you a couple extra pieces of information. A couple extra pieces of information. Number one, in Daniel chapter 4, there's a different fact that science used to think was wrong. The Bible was right about Nebuchadnezzar building Babylon. See, a number of years ago, they thought Nebuchadnezzar, who we are actually studying Nebuchadnezzar number two, there was an earlier Nebuchadnezzar that doesn't make it into the Bible, but there was an early Nebuchadnezzar in Babylonian times, and those earlier kings are the ones who built Babylon, according to their archaeology. And so they said, see, the Bible is wrong, because after all, it wasn't this Nebuchadnezzar who built Babylon, it was another guy. It couldn't have been Nebuchadnezzar writing this story, and it couldn't have been Daniel who was actually there. But guess what? A number of years ago, they found some inscriptions that demonstrated at one point in time, Babylon had fallen into ruin, and this Nebuchadnezzar is the one who rebuilt it all, who brought it back to its glory days and made it again into one of the wonders of the ancient world. So the Bible was proven right, even though the archaeology at the time thought it was wrong. Now, you have to know that, because Daniel chapter 4 is the same chapter we're talking about, okay? Number two, the reliability of the Dead Sea manuscripts have often been in question. What that means is that they always and often make small mistakes and big mistakes in lots of different places. Because the Dead Sea Scrolls contain tons of different manuscripts from all over the place. In fact, this is what my professor said about them. He said, the Dead Sea Scroll fragment describing this event likely comes from the Hellenistic or Roman period when Greek, Latin, and especially Jewish writers were known for confusing some of the Assyrian and Babylonian leaders. They quite frequently, because it's been 600 years, they quite frequently get names wrong. Okay? So according to my professor, the most likely option is that the Dead Sea Scrolls were wrong with their naming this event for Nabonidus, and it was really all about Nebuchadnezzar. Now, why am I getting into into all this? Why are we taking a little bit of time going through academic stuff, going to school, stuff like that? It's because I want you to know something. I want you to read your Bible. It's fascinating. But more than that, I want you to trust your Bible. Because time and time again, it gets confirmed as telling us the truth. Now, why is that important? You know, there's nothing in this story that determines whether or not you're going to heaven. You you can be a follower of Jesus Christ. God promises you heaven one of these days. And you don't have to believe that Nebuchadnezzar was a real man or that this story even happened to him. That's not a prerequisite or requirement to getting into heaven. God's not going to say, okay, now tell me about Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, you got that one wrong. Hell. He's not going to do that. That's what Jesus came for, to to liberate us from all those kinds of worries about God is just going to find something wrong with us and then send us off. That's not the issue. But why is it important that it really happened? Because if it really happened, then the lesson to be learned from it is about a real God working with a real human being to make some real changes. So, the point in this context is that you can't avoid this fiery trial. But you can choose if it's for God or from God. See, Nebuchadnezzar was going to walk through a fiery trial. It was either going to be the one that he chose to walk through 
for God, to honor God, or it was going to be the fiery trial that God was going to bring his way because he didn't follow God. And you have the choice if it's for God or from God. Well, let's find out how this story ends. Verse 34. Verse 34, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High, I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back His hand or say to Him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt the glor- and glorify the King of heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Write that down. Those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. He says this, this pagan king. He says there's a God in heaven and he calls him king. Nebuchadnezzar calls God the king. And he says that king is in charge. He does whatever he wants and it's always good. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. But there's something going on deep here. that You got to know. God brings a humiliating circumstance to Nebuchadnezzar. But God never intended for that to be where it ended. God doesn't judge Nebuchadnezzar and leave him there. God doesn't bring humiliation to Nebuchadnezzar and then walk away. It was written into the judgment from the very beginning that God would judge, but then he would restore. And so Nebuchadnezzar, as a cow, looks up to heaven. And God says, that's enough. And he gives him his sanity back. And then once he gets his sanity back, he realizes he's a human being. He's like, God, you're in charge. And God says, that's enough. I'll give you your kingdom back. And then he gets his kingdom back and he becomes even greater than all that. And he gets all this stuff and all these people are surrounding him, telling him how glorious he is and his kingdom is more glorious. And yet he says, I've learned my lesson. I praise the king in heaven. See, God only brings you to the place of blessing or curse because he also intends for that to be a place you move beyond. It looks like this. Here's our chart. A decision for God leads me through fire, but eventually to blessing. A decision for me leads me through ease, but eventually to a curse. But that's not the end of the story. As a matter of fact, the blessing and the curse are just one more beginning stage to a new decision we have to make. Will I choose God or not? He constantly gives us another choice and another choice and another chance and another chance until that time comes when you're done. And in chapter 5, we'll find a situation when the time is done. But until you stop breathing, your time isn't done. And so I want to let you know, those who walk in pride, God is able to humble Because there is a God in heaven who is in charge. No matter what it looks like on this earth, he is always and totally and completely in charge. You think you're in charge? So did Nebuchadnezzar, and he was wrong. You think you've encountered just a stretch of bad luck? So might Nebuchadnezzar's followers, but they were wrong. This was God bringing the humiliation on him for one purpose and one purpose only, so that he would see and lift his eyes up to heaven and be restored. Friends, I want to leave you with just three thoughts as we go to our time of reflection. Number one, humiliation can be avoided if we humble ourselves first. If we just choose to humble ourselves first, even though it feels like walking through fire, we avoid the humiliation. Number two, moments of humiliation might be the first stage of restoration. If you're going through a phase right now where you feel humiliated, things aren't working out for you the way you think they should work out, well, maybe that's God trying to lead you into a place of restoration. Lift your eyes to heaven. 
Regain your sanity. Praise God in heaven and see what he does. Number three, when God comes first, everything else falls into place. I say this every time I get a chance. When God comes first, everything else falls into place. (coughs) Regardless of appearances, he's always in charge. And if you live by it, everything else finds its place. Let me invite you to take a moment in reflection now. Take that card out and jot some thoughts down on the back side of it. What is God trying to speak into your hearts? Maybe even ask him this question, God, where in my life do I need to humble myself to you one more time? Where in my life do I need to submit myself to you one more time? And just see what he says. Let me pray for you. Thank you for listening to this message from Lafayette Community Church. We believe that God has a full and fulfilling life in store for you, and we want to help you live it. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me, Pastor Jeff, through the web form at lafayettecommunitychurch.com. And as always, I encourage you to plug into a solid, God-honoring community wherever you may be. Life is a journey, and no one should ever walk alone.